Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Bless you. Pour out your spirit now. Give us yourself in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Children are invited to go to Children's Church. So this, this past week or so, a reprint in the Atlantic, a reprint of an article that came out just before the year lost to COVID, a poignant article that they said this needs to get back in the discussion, so they put it back out. Now, the title of it is, Why Are Young People Having So Little SEX? Despite the easing, this little subheader, despite the easing of taboos and the rise of hookup apps, Americans are in the middle of a sex recession. Now, I want to say, if you're a millennial and you, and you, and you see that, I want to allow you some indignation, right? <laughs> You've been like, our whole lives they've been warning us off, and now that we're not doing it, you're freaking out over that. <laughs> I mean, make up your minds. We can play it either way, but you've got to decide, Right? If I were to quote parts of this article, that would probably make one of those amazingly rare Sundays when everyone stays awake through the whole sermon. (laughs) But the reasons are complex. And let's just say that holiness did not figure in the article. That was not a category that was given as a reason. Here's how the author winds her way down after a a quite long and thoughtful and complex piece. When Toys R Us announced this spring, after saying it had been struggling because of falling birth rates, that it would be shutting down, some observers mordantly remarked that it could be added to the list of things that millennials had destroyed. In American life, a fundamental change may be underway. In 2017, the U.S. birth rate hit a record low for a second year running. Birth rates are declining among women in their 30s, the the years that women are most likely to have children. A more immediate concern involves the political social consequences of loneliness and alienation. And the author talks some about online trolls and talks about economic challenges these days to young folks getting out and on their own. And then she goes on and she says, When I began working on this story, I expected that these kinds of big picture issues might figure prominently within it. I was pretty sure I'd hear lots of worry about economic insecurity and other contributors to a generally precarious future. I also imagined a fairly lengthy inquiry into the benefits of loosening social conventions. But these expectations have mostly fallen to the side, she says, and my concerns have become more basic. Human sexual behavior is one of the things that distinguish us from other species. She quotes the UCLA professor Jared Diamond, who has studied the evolution of human sexuality, and he wrote, along with posture and brain size, Sexuality completes the trinity of the decisive aspects in which the ancestors of humans and the great apes diverged. In other words, coming at it from the evolutionary side is the observation of what God has always known and set us up for, that the deepest human connection is in that space. And that that is something that is particularly different for us as beings created in the image of God. It's all in Genesis chapter 2. We'll do that some other day. As our society, though, friends, transitions in significant and paradigm-level changing ways, even the deepest ways of human intimacy are being affected. That's what the article's about. That's me, not her. As our society continues to transition, even the very deepest ways of what it means to be human are being affected and are changing. The author says this, When over the course of my reporting, people in their 20s shared with me their hopes and fears and inhibitions, I sometimes felt pangs of recognition. Just as often, though, I was taken aback by what seemed like heartbreaking changes in the way many people were relating, and here's the important bit, or not relating, 
And that's what it's about, to one another. I am not so very much older than the people I talked with for this story, and yet I frequently had the sense of being from a different time. This is a hip, smart, young woman writing for The Atlantic. And she's saying, I'm interviewing these 20-somethings, and, and she's saying she feels like she's come from a different time. Something is changing, and it's changing profoundly. She says, the world has changed in so many ways so quickly. In time, maybe we will rethink some things. Be good, won't it? It'll be good to be part of that conversation. It'd be good as followers of Jesus to be part of that conversation. Why did we start with this this morning? What's the point? Subconsciously at least. Subconsciously at least. Sex is about me believing that the world goes on and wanting to see my life extended through another into the future as it comes. It's about me believing subconsciously, implicitly at least, that there is a story to be lived. Anybody else see my favorite bumper sticker from the 2016 election? It was popular with millennials. It said, you know, giant asteroid 2016. Just put us out of this craziness. Just come on and blow the place up. What this is saying is there's a crying out amongst this younger generation to say, where is a space that is real? Where is a space that is genuine? Where is a space that is big enough, strong enough, secure enough, good enough, beautiful enough to hold a human soul? To give a future and hope. And into which then I want to risk my deepest self and participate and even then see the future extended beyond me onto a horizon through one that I love. I can tell you right now, folks, the first time you come home from the hospital after your wife has given birth, the horizon has changed. And you are out of control at a level you've never been out of control before. Right? Dudes, we can hang out and we can devil may care it. And you can add a, 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 a adventuresome woman into the mix and you can keep going somewhat. But you have that little one and the whole game changes. The equation is different. And so this is about young people saying, I just don't know. The world is such a mess. I want to say that God has not left us. He has not disappeared. As things transition, even as they look so very broken, still, God is at work. God is in the mix. God is aware and he is working. We're going, to, we're going to see Paul say this morning that in Jesus Christ, God has said yes to the world. When's the last time you heard a sermon on God saying yes? In Jesus Christ, God has said yes to his world. And Paul, friends, who wrote those words, Paul was a life turned on by the belief that God has said yes. And God is not forever in the business of saying no. When Paul came to believe that in Jesus Christ God has said yes, the world changed. There's a brilliant English historian of the ancient world some handful of years ago, he was a part of the rather poignant neo-atheist movement in England, and he was a loud voice in the UK, a, a stinging voice. But something happened. In 2016, he wrote a piece in which he said he had come to realize that the, the good things of Western culture, the good things that we love about Western culture, are not a product of Rome or Greece. Remember, he's an atheist ancient world historian. He's been arguing for all these years that Christianity gets in the way and if we just go with the Greek and Roman thing, we'd be fine. And finally something flips in his head. And he says, I've come to realize that that's not true. 
that what is good, the good inheritance that we have in Western culture is not from Rome or Greece, it's from Christian faith. He concludes the article saying, In my morals and ethics, I have learned to accept that I am not Greek or Roman at all, but thoroughly and proudly Christian. Can you imagine what he took for saying those words? He says some amazing things in his book. He wrote a big, fat overview of Christian influence, Christian history, Christian influence in the West. In the early chapters, he says this. He says, The fabric of things was rent. A new order of time had come into existence, and all that had previously served to separate people was now, as a consequence, dissolved. He quotes Paul as saying, There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. And he says, Only the world turned upside down could ever have sanctioned such an unprecedented, such a revolutionary announcement. And when Paul said that, that made a lot of trouble for Paul. But as Tom Holland writes, Yet Paul refused to compromise. Instead, he doubled down. By urging his converts to consider themselves neither Galatian nor Jewish, but solely as the people of Christ, as citizens of heaven, he was urging them to adapt an identity that was as globalist as it was innovative. We'll say innovative because he's from the UK. A bold strategy, he says, but one for which Paul refused to apologize. He goes on in the next chapter to say, in the church writ large, there was something utterly unique in the history of the world. Never before had there been anything quite like it. A citizenship that was owed not to birth, not to descent, not to legal prescriptions, but to belief alone. A whole new social reality breaking into the fabric of history. Paul, friends, how? How does Paul come to have the audaciousness to go about proclaiming something completely new and knowing it, and knowing he's doing something that's going to make massive ripples for Jews and for Greeks and for Romans and for everybody. Things that have never, qualitatively never been said before. Paul believed that in Jesus Christ, God has said yes to his world. For the Son of God, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, was not yes and no, but in him it was always yes, for all the promises of God find their yes in him. The promises of God, God's love, his chesed, committed, faithful, visceral love for you for his creation, for his world, his desire that his image bearers should be whole and beautiful and healthy and full of joy and life. God's determined love that he took upon himself and expressed in covenant commitment the deepest possible way it can be expressed, which means that God says, I will take the hit, I will take the cost, I will work it out. I'll do it. His presence in Jesus Christ, his presence, his Holy Spirit, the spirit of Jesus himself, never leaving us alone, providing hope, a new creation, a future and a hope, a hope that is already one. And so then Paul, because he believes that in Jesus all God's promises have come true and God has spoken a resounding yes to his world, Paul then later in 2 Corinthians will say, working together with him, Paul says this is who we are, this is who we are, working together with God. We encourage you not to receive the gift of God in vain, for God says in a time of favor I heard you, in a day of salvation, I heard you and helped you. And Paul says, now is that right time. Now is that pregnant moment. 
now is that time in Jesus Christ when God has moved. He's heard our cries. He's helping us in the person of Jesus. Paul says, now is the day of salvation, which in the Greek is a big word that means eternity and today. It's wholeness. It's the fullness of what we are meant and made to be. And God's saying, now is the time of living into the wholeness of who you are. Now is the time because I have, pro I have proved myself and I have moved. So then Paul says, because this is who we are, because this is what we're about, because this is the story we're living, we don't put stuff in people's way. Rather, rather. I love the little hinge words in the, in the Bible, in the New Testament. I love the little hinge words. Some of them are what I call building hinge words, the so that's. Paul is forever doing this. This is true, true this is true, live this way, live this way, live this way, so that these other things might be true. The therefore, for Paul, the therefore. Because this is all true, because God's done this thing, therefore live this way. I love the building little words. But my favorite little words are the turn it. I call them the building and the turn it words. And this one is the best of all the turn it words. Rather. You can throw at me whatever you want. You can say whatever you want. You can say whatever you want about how the world is or about who we are or about what we're doing, but rather than all that, God is doing this. Rather than all that, God has done these things. Paul goes on then, and he says, rather than, rather, rather than what people think, rather than cynicism, rather than giving up, rather, in all things. And then a wonderfully odd little phrase, and you could literally translate it like this, in all things we position ourselves, or more literally even would be we stand with ourselves. We stand with ourselves as servants of God. In other words, friends, this is Paul and his companions' self-consciousness. This is their only self-consciousness as they go through the world. We position ourselves, we stand with ourselves, we know ourselves to be servants of God. And that, friends, is freedom. That is freedom. Paul then tells us what in all things looks like. He gives us one of his famous, what, lists. Now, come on, fess up. What do you do when you hit a list in the Bible? Are, are you a read through it quickly, or are you a skip over it altogether? <laughs> Does anybody do anything other than that? <laughs> when you hit a list in Paul, at least in Paul, I mean, I, I know, I know, there's that thing in Numbers about, and his pasture lands, and his pasture lands, and his pasture lands. I, I have a hard time getting through that, too. I'm like, okay, already. I got it, all right? I mean, there's pasture lands. They're giving them out, right? But in Paul, friends, when you hit a list, take your Bible reading plan that because you are a good, accomplished, educated person living on the meritocratic North Shore, you have to keep up with or you feel bad about yourself. Take it and throw it in the trash and say, forget it, and sit on the list. I'm not kidding. Take it one freaking word a day. Take it one word a day and sit on it and pray through it. I mean, what is the point? Is the point to check the box? I did it. I read the Bible in a year. Woo the point is to get it in, right? Take it one word a day. Pray your way through it. I've told you before, Greek has these wonderful compound words, right? Sort of like German does. So we're going to read the list. We're going to translate the compound words closer to what they feel like. All right? Working together with God in all things, all things, we understand ourselves to be standing with God as servants of God. That's who we are. That's our self-consciousness. In much holding on. Paul repeats the prepositions too. 
in much holding on, in severe hassles, in hardship, in being squeezed into tight spaces that you don't want to be in, presumed about, presumed upon, put in a box, in plagues. Anybody have a plague lately? Any plagues to deal with lately in this modern world? In jail. The next one in the English we translate as in confusion. It's one of these lovely compound words. It literally means in times where there seems no secure place to stand. You don't know what to do. There seems no good option. There seems no secure place to stand. In confusion. In suffering. In sleeplessness driven by cares, in fasting, in innocence, in knowledge paid for by a loss of innocence or a loss of naivete. Who's the Irish poet who said, what is the price of experience that men pay for it with a song or wisdom with a dance in the street? No, it's bought the price of every man that every man has. Alex, who's that? Oh, I'm so sorry. It's your moment. (laughs) Alex does know his English literature, friends. Trust me on that. That's Irish, so we'll let you off the hook there. Endurance. In kindness. He's turning a corner. In the Holy Spirit. You ready for the next one? We translate it as genuine love. It's not bad. I'm not saying it's bad. But again, if you take it the word literally and break it down, it is love without judgment. It is love without judgment. That's powerful, isn't it? In love without judgment. In words of honesty. In the power of God. And now he's going to change his preposition. Through instruments of power in the right hand and the left. Right? So that first whole thing, it's in. It's wherever we're in. Now it's through, meaning we take these things and we move them. We work with them. Through. Instruments of power in the right hand and the left. Through glory and dishonor. Either one of them, fine. I'll walk in it. Through slander and being spoken well of. Okay. And now my favorites. Changes to as if. As if unreliable, yet true. As if unknown, yet known. As if dying, yet behold, we live on. As if punished, yet not killed. As if grieving, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, yet possessing everything. Difference, which one speak to you? Which ones speak to you? What I like about this is when you have imposter syndrome, when you have FOMO, when you got people online saying ridiculous things to you, when you're playing the tracks in your head of the stupid and horrible things you've done somewhere in your life or in the past, when you're a parent, you find yourself doing those things you said you've never, you know, I've never, I'll never say that here, I'm saying it. You know, whatever it is. Whatever it is for you, when you hit those dark places, and when and when the enemy gets in your head and says, "I mean, who do you think you are? You think you're walking around with Almighty God?" What's the answer to that? Yes, yes, I am. Thank you. You nailed it. Well put. <laughs> Our self consciousness is that in all things we position ourselves as servants of God. The rest, we move through it, we move with it, we move past it, we move rather than it. And this is security for living. There's a famous American historian who's Sterling Professor of History, at, which is highest you can be at Yale. His name was David Bryan Davis. In 1966, the year of my birth, ironically-ish for, the, for this story, he wrote a book called the Problem of Slavery in Western Civilization. He won the Pulitzer Prize for it. It was the beginning of a trifecta for him. And it was a paradigm-shifting American history book because he insisted 
that slavery is not incidental to the history of the West, but profoundly important, and it changed the course of the study of American history. Way back in 1999, in the former millennium, when I was graduating from this esteemed institution, I wrote a paper about how some slaves were getting converted in the Great Awakening, and how their owners were going, oh my word, they're people because they've got Jesus too, and they were freaking out, trying to figure out what to do with this. I actually got the opportunity to go to Yale to talk to David Brian Davis. I didn't even study American history as an undergraduate. I'm walking up the stairs to David Brian Davis's office at Yale, and I'm having a major imposter syndrome moment, even though it wasn't a thing yet. I know you have yours too. You've told me about them. Who am I? Well, maybe it is true. Who am I? I am a servant of the living God because God in Jesus Christ has said yes to his world, and that's all I need to know for this. Maybe it's a lot more mundane than that, right? Maybe it's tomorrow morning. It's another day. Maybe I'm not so much looking forward to it. Maybe it's going to be tough. Maybe I'm going to be the only believer in my office. Maybe I'm going to see the pain in one of my co-workers' lives, but maybe I'm going to know that if I just even simply say, can I pray for you, it's a landmine, it'll blow up. Maybe I just don't want to face the difficult list. Maybe there's people I love who are in another place And they're having great fun and I'm stuck here and I feel like whatever it is, it's still true, friends, that in Jesus, God has said yes. And that you are, as you walk through the calling that God has given you for this time, whatever that is, you are a fellow worker with God. And in all things, you understand yourself to be walking with him and as a servant of his. We want to pray, just simply want to pray that God would speak his yes into the parts of your heart that hear a no. Let's pray. I invite you simply to open up with our Lord about those places where whatever it is, your insecurity your loneliness, your anxiety, your regrets, your habits, your sense of your own inadequacy or difficult people, situations that are unjust, that are wrong, people who are prejudiced against you for whatever reason, things that that they don't understand and you don't feel you're able to speak to, whatever it is. Lord, would you pour out your spirit and give your people the opportunity to hear you say yes, that your promises are fulfilled in Christ Jesus, and therefore you are with each each one, that person, as they lift up to you, Lord, those hard places. You are with them.